Hey Design Spark, we've got another dev kit to look at today, and this one will be of particular interest to you if you're looking to create a secure BLE enabled embedded application. And the dev kit we're looking at today is for the RSL15 from OnSemi. So without further ado, let's get to it. So let's start with the RSL15 device itself. It's a system on a chip that OnSemi have designed around an ARM Cortex M33 processor. And it's pretty clear that OnSemi are looking to address as many of the concerns an IoT product designer may have as possible with this device. First off, external support circuitry has been minimised by including the RF balen for the antenna and the oscillators for the Bluetooth hardware internally on the RSL15. Power management is also included internally. Both of these inclusions are a win for designers short on board space looking for a minimal bill of materials. The ARM Cortex 33 itself is built from the newer ARM V8 architecture that includes a lot of new features, not least of which revolve around enhancing security. IoT devices have long been considered the soft underbelly of network attack vectors and this is addressed by inclusion of the ARM CryptoCell 312 and ARM TrustZone. If you're unfamiliar with it, TrustZone is an extension that has been on Cortex-A devices for quite some time, and it creates hardware isolation, allowing developers to work with secure and non-secure regions of the device. These regions can be memory areas in RAM or flash, as you'd expect, but can also be peripherals or interrupts, Unsecure code cannot access or even see secure regions, protecting mission-critical code and hardware from accidental or malicious interference. It is set up so the equipment can be securely managed through its lifecycle stages, such as a manufacture state where encryption keys and a secure bootloader would be installed before being put into a secure state for delivery to a customer. Faulty devices can be put into an RMA state that will allow troubleshooting. The point is that when running, user code must access secure APIs in order to use secured resources, and only authenticated code is allowed to run, which hardens your devices against malicious actors. Not only is it secure, but the RSL15 is also extremely low power and very efficient. So good, in fact, that it tops out the ULP mark core mark table for its class. Now this is a measure of the energy efficiency of active microcontrollers. As you would expect, there are a set of low power modes that the device can use to minimise power consumption. But one feature that caught my eye is SmartSense, which essentially allows the M33 to remain in a deep sleep mode while monitoring sensor interfaces through the ADC as shown here, where data continuously feeds into the FIFO until it is full and sends out an interrupt in order to be read. Of course, all this goodness is here to support Bluetooth 5.2 applications, and OnSemi have gone big on supporting the localization features of BLE, like trilateration using received signal strength indication, and direction finding using angle of arrival and angle of departure methods. If you're interested in finding out more about these techniques, there's a lot of information on the Bluetooth SIG site. Now that we know what we're dealing with, let's get the dev kit out. Here's the box our kit comes in. It has quite a nice plain retro look to it. it looks pretty eco-friendly too. Opening it up we have eco-conscious packaging to protect our kit. And turning it over we find our USB-C cable to connect to our PC. And digging a little deeper, here is our dev kit board safe in its anti-static bag. When we take the board out of the bag, the first thing that strikes me is how relatively low density the layout is. Gives you an idea of how compact an application design could be. Let's identify some of the top side board features here. At the top here we have our integrated PCB antenna. There is also a UFL connector for the RF output, 
but this isn't connected by default. We have a couple of push button switches, one for reset and the other is a user switch connected to GPIO 0. Talking of GPIOs, here's our GPIO headers and a JTAG header compatible with JLink devices. Here's our actual RSL15 device itself. And here below our switches are two user LEDs, one blue and one green. This uh, rather retro looking 8 pin dip switch is mostly used for isolating the onboard J-Link microcontroller from the RSL15. The automatic switching power supply is set up to run from a 3 volt battery, the USB connection or an external source and flipping the board over Here is the CR2032 coin cell holder. Here's the USB connector. And this is the MCU controlling the USB interface and running our Sega J-Link debugger. OK, so that's our board. Let's power it up and check out the SDK. The place to get our software development tools is here on the OnSemi website at the product page for the RSL15. Handily, as well as a description and data sheet, there is also a download section that has our documentation package, IDE installer and firmware package. There are also some extra tools to help with security and BLE application development. I strongly recommend you download the RSL15 documentation package. When you download the zip file, and open it up, you will find this inside. A nicely laid out HTML document pack that includes all your guides and reference manuals with a handy index down the side here so you can easily find any of the things that you might want to while you're developing. Okay, so let's go back to the download page and download the installer. So that's downloaded. Let's go back and also download the firmware package. Right, so those are downloading quite nicely. And as they are quite large files, I'm going to use the magic of editing to speed this process up. But while they're downloading, one thing I should point out, I suppose, is that if you're new to OnSemi, you will need to register to be able to get these downloads. But they don't ask you for too much in the way of information, so it's not a particularly onerous prospect. So if we go back to our destination folder, we can extract our contents. So let's extract this. We'll extract it here. And we'll extract the firmware package as well while we're at it. Uh, so extract here. Great. So the first thing we're going to do is start to install our IDE with the installer. And I think we can just keep all of the defaults. We are going to need this JLink installed as well so we'll do that and install yep and this is going to take a few moments so I'll speed the process up again okay great so before we run this let's just install the Sega components that we want as well. Let's agree to that and keep on with the default settings. And okay. And we'll finish. And we can finish that and launch our IDE. And first thing it'll do is ask us for a workspace. So I'm going to keep the default again. And here 
we are. If you're a seasoned developer, you'll notice this is an Eclipse-based IDE. And before we do anything else, we're going to want to import our firmware pack. So to do that, we need to go up here and open the perspective. We'll go to our CMSYS pack manager and open that. And from here, we can open this to import our files. And here's our pack. Open that. And here's our RSL 15. And if we come down here, we have one device, our RSL 15. And if we go over to our examples, we have this long list of examples. And this is everything that's included for us in the firmware pack. And this is quite a lot of examples, but of course, you know where we're going to start, don't you? It has to be Blinky. So if we click on it and highlight it, let's copy it. And that will copy a project into our project manager. If we open it up, we can see some of our files there in our workspace. And at the bottom here, we have a readme file, which is worth having a little look at. We'll open that up. All of the apps have one of these readme files, and they explain all about the app and how to use it and what you should expect and so on. And one thing to highlight is this debug catch mode. Now this is here because some apps may go into low power mode or reset too quickly for the debugger to catch um, as it will still be connecting. This option will force the CPU into a loop for long enough to let the debugger connect. It's a useful bit of code and you will probably want to include it in your applications as you develop them. Anyway, let's get back to building the Blinky app. So, first off what we're going to do is create a debug version of this, so we'll build it. And we can see all the operations happening in the build console down here. And voila, our Blinky app is built. So now that our program is built, we have a new folder here called debug. And inside our debug folder, we have a hex file, which uh, is an executable that we can flash using something like JLink Commander. And we also have our debug code in the form of this blinky.elf. So let's uh, have a go at debugging. And to do that, we're going to right click on here, go down to debug as, and we're going to go to the debug configurations. And here we want to be going to the GDB Sega JLink debugging, and we'll click on that, and double click on that, and that'll give us a new configuration. So if we go into our debugger setup, the first thing we want to do is put in our device name, which is RSL15. We want to make sure that we remove this no GUI option. And just check that the interface is SWD, that's good. We go up to startup. We want to make sure this initial reset and halt is unchecked. And if we apply those and debug, away we go. And we're launched. OK, we'll do something about that firmware update in a little while. And we are going to switch the perspective. And here we go. The app has run up to the first breakpoint, which is right here 
at the beginning of the main function. And if we hit resume, it will run. And hopefully you can see the lights flashing there on our board. Fantastic. So now we have our first application running. OK, I'm going to stop that now. So, what do I think of the RSL15 EVA kit? It's certainly a well-supported board with a long list of examples to show off its functionality. Now, obviously, I haven't been developing in earnest here, but I've certainly enjoyed getting to grips with the RSL15. And it's been pretty easy, which is, of course, down to how well-supported it is. So, what I would probably say about the RSL15 is that it should definitely be on your contender list for BLE applications if you happen to be in the market for a new BLE system on a chip. Well, that's about all we've got time for today. So I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you again soon. Until then, goodbye.